Do you have a mic there? She may still want to discuss after doing this for three years, two or three years. And, um, and much like the peace challenges the audience, what came up for me uh, as a question is in this journey over three years, what are the points of challenge that, you know, those points that came up for you as creators um, with doing this piece you shared with me? some stipulations around or engagement that MAP, you know, was asking of you and uh, there may be some other points of, of challenge because process has those moments, they have those moments, right? The, the, the processes of creating. So if you could talk maybe a little bit about that. Well, um, uh, Okui and I uh, have been together um, on this path of Miriam since 2011, actually. I think that's when we started working. And so from the very beginning to now. And so I feel like um, our, uh, her daughter was born during the process. Um, so, you know, life was taking us through so many different paths and we were building Miriam and so a relationship, uh, uh, a, a real trust, I think, um, you know, grew for me, which I, I, I find really amazing. So that even in the times that we were off, we would come back, we'd never have any time to really rebuild the piece, so we just jump in, you know, like uh, Okui is coming from her premiere of Bronx Gothic this past week. And, you know, I'm coming from creating my current piece. Um, and so we just get here and we have one day to get into it. And so I think uh, that's really, uh, that would not be possible had we not you know, grown together to a point where we really know we've internalized the piece and we can listen to each other. Um, I, I can't I can think of another occasion that has happened for me with, uh, you know, someone who's in the piece. I'm sorry, my brain is... Oh, this is your beat. Um, well, just like, yeah. <laughs> I can keep talking now. So. <laughs> People were throwing out images and visuals, things that came up for them, resonated with them, things they heard, saw, felt. So um, if there are questions like, this is, they're the ones, you know, and uh, these images that came up, they were so strong. And to me, they, uh, they, they could inform questions about some of the choices you've made for the piece, um, those images that were so powerful that folks popcorned out around sound, around light, and so, symbolic um, things. Does anyone any have a particular question on these images? You guys were having such an interesting conversation. Know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, no, no. We can get started again. Um, the intention of the plastic bag. Right, so the intention of the plastic bag at the beginning of the dance. Why stones? Why plastic bag? Why your foot in the air? Yeah, what was, what was the thought process behind that? Okay, so, um, uh, the birth of Venus. I was, I'm very interested in, um, in art history in general, and all the, uh, the presence or absence of um, Africa in what's called art history. I'm sure if there are any art historians here, you know that whatever you're studying does not include Africa. 
Um, so, uh, the Botticelli Venus, you know, being birthed out of nothing, um, air, and that's the ideal of beauty, I think, for women in the West. Oh, a beauty that we have been asked to embody the rest of us. So then I was thinking, along with Okui, if we had to present one image of a, an African woman, of a black woman, what would that be? And study with this birth of Venus. So of course, that's our birth of Venus, but she comes with her shit. <laughs> you know, she's coming out of earth out of a real hard material because I come from Zimbabwe so it has to be rocks um, you know so, so 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 you know that is why you know uh, you know we we come into this world with mocked already and that's sort of part of one way to address that yes yeah, so also the Venus that's the, and also the foam, you know, Venus also was born on the, on the foam, and it's another kind of light, air, water, and to have the, the rocks and the weights, um, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think of African women, they imagine them carrying things on their heads, they're always, you know, they're not just, not just the weight of our perceptions and what we project onto them, but also they're actually often carrying It's also, I'm sorry, let me just add, it's, not, it's also a robe, actually. It's not just plastic, it's sort of a, a, a coat robe, you know, like you would wear in the coat of Louis the Sixteenth. you know, this robe. So it's, it's actually extremely elaborately made um, out of plastic and rubber. And that's also one of a lace and bottle caps. So anybody has been to the continent, you know that we don't throw away a lot of things, that we use them to make beautiful things. And so that's really a beautiful robe. Sorry, I cut you. Especially women are not supposed to look at, you know. So there's also like, this fetish object that's happening in the dark that you can kind of see, and can't see anyway. That kind of answered my question a little bit. Um, I was going to take it to that next moment where it kind of seemed like um, she was she embodied a present day kind of woman, and you were like her shadow spirit guy or something like that, and. Um, I know you, in this you were saying that something about the, the, the boundaries and lines, and I was wondering about the lines that these blue lines physically represented for the piece and for the difference. It, it seemed like a separator between the realms that you guys existed on on stage, and um, I thought it was interesting when she splashed the water on her face, and it seemed like for a second she had changed her identity or. Um, even when she got over there, she had got the shoes and clothes and a new attitude, and she was in her moment, but nobody saw her. Like, I didn't see her. And when it was her time to shine, and I felt like that was kind of, it made me think about um, colorism in politics and like dark skinned girls and how a lot of times their beauty is like not appreciated and nobody sees it sometimes and they're having their like I, I just imagine her having her moment and I couldn't even see it like and I wanted to see it I wanted to see her enjoying it and then I, I realized when she was looking in the mirror um, at her reflection when she was looking at herself um, and her other on the other side of the mirror was the only time that I saw her before it seemed like she killed her reflection or tried to kill that connection 
and it seemed like that that shadow spirit was like in woe because she had forgotten her and she didn't connect. And <laughs> But she was still crying and she was singing the song of praise while she was walking around and it seemed like she was walking in the darkness in the danger zone. I'm sorry, there's this, there's this whole story that I've told. And, and, and when she was up here with the lights and she was exploring her sexuality. And, but she was like, don't look because that was a really uncomfortable moment. You know, sexuality. I'm like, what? That's a whole for everybody. And I, I really enjoyed the, the comic relief when she was like, don't look. But really, all we could see was her. Um, and I really also thought it was interesting when it was pitch black and she was moving around in a circle. But And I knew she was working and creating, but I couldn't see her. And it made me think about this mystery of God and um, a creator that's working in an unseen realm. Um, yes. <laughs> It's, it's okay, I don't need the mic, thanks. Uh, from a, a create, creating the piece standpoint, um, what was the first jumping off point for you guys being in the space together? Did you start uh, from movement or from sound or a combination of a bunch of things? How did you begin the creation process of it? It started uh, with uh, with the death of Miriam McKenna. Uh, so something kind of switched on. Um, so even before we got to the studio, the piece was already uh, growing in my head, um, this idea of this icon, um, and how we make them uh, become not human. You know, and so when she died, that was kind of shocking to me. You know, that how could she possibly die? I mean, she was very much You know, so you know, it made me sort of reflect on uh, on that sort of status that she kind of held. And so I just started to think about what her life could have been, and building this 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 image of this woman. You know, um, so for me, the the work does not really start in the studio. It, start, it starts with this, with this impulse, with this um, inspiration. And then I go and read everything that is possible to read about the thing. Can you talk a little bit about some of those choices, um, like Heart Darkness and the passages you pulled from there? Um, so, but there was also, there is Joseph Conrad, of course, which I think in, in the USA, you read it in high school or something like this. Uh, there's also uh, the, the King of the Belgian, uh, I forget the exact title of the book. King Leopold. King Leopold's Ghost. Um, because actually, if you read them together, you understand why Conrad was in Africa in the first place. <laughs> it's, it's kind of fascinating. Um, but then I, I also love poetry, I love Rilke. So um, to me, Makeba and all the Marys that I started to conjure up, you know, the mother of Jesus, uh, the sister of Moses, um, <laughs> that there's just something that uh, Rilke allowed me to tap into that other worldliness, that, that largesse that these Marys have. So, you know, gathering all this material and then also um, reaching out to Hui and saying, well, you know, I have to work with you because this idea uh, of this icon is too big for one person. And so that is decided before we even get into the studio, really, that there has to be two bodies embracing uh, that, that actually one person, you know? 
um, and at different times sharing the text uh, with Okui, writing a script that is a script. I like to script everything that I do. I, I like to think of myself as thinking not in the typical way that dancers do. Um, really, I, the word is important to me. Um, so I feel, I feel like, you know, English is my second language and it is a war trophy. So I'm still wrestling it and, and owning it. And so uh, the scripting is something that comes first. It's yeah. interesting you say scripting because visual art is something that you love, but film, you were drawn to film, so that has never left you really as a creator. Right. Um, so once yes, you had the text, you, you adhered to the text? I mean, you, you created the text so. and then we you were... Very much so. to the text, and if we, we, uh, we divert from it, we add to the text, so we're always working from the spine that is, you know, so everything is named, so we know what we're talking about in the group, whether it's the, uh, the, the production manager or the sound designer, we all are working from the same script. Um, really, and, and, and that has been a very useful um, tool, especially as you know, the, a work that lives this long, there is quite a bit of changeover with the people working with the piece. So if we didn't really have the script, it would be, I mean, it's still difficult to, um, you know, embed someone in, into, into a work that, that, you know, we really Build from process. It was highly collaborative too. It's, it's you know so 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 you know from the beginning with Okui wrestling with the script and the text and then also at some point getting a director Eric Ting and his contributions and then you know Omar Sosa. I mean I was kind of crisscrossing to you know here and there. I, I, I had to meet Omar in Barcelona to talk about what the sound was going to be. We were in a studio, we were in Lyon as a group, we were all over the some place the trying to... Some of the text is also in the sound score. Hmm. Okay, so cool. Sorry. Right, right. So that's kind of, you know, so movement is almost uh, the very last thing uh, that I arrive at. <laughs> um, once I've built the space, you know, um, and I have to know what the space is. I don't really wait for the designer to tell me what the space is because it is my world, you know, and I feel very, very capable of at least creating that world. You know, so the finer things come a little bit later with somebody who has skills, you know, to really create, you know, like these dogs or, you know, the lights at the ladder and stuff. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't even describe it, um, but I, I want to ask about, uh, I haven't read her a biography or much about her, a little music of Miriam Makiba. If, if there's anything that, obviously I, I have plenty that I could learn on my own, but if there's anything you would like to say about uh, her name in this piece, and I, I know you mentioned other Miriams as well, but um, if there's any, any comment you'd like to add, I'm curious as to her relationship to the piece and how... <laughs> Um, well, like I said, you know, she's an icon to me, you know, um, she's part of an era or a generation that was, you know, with the revolution, the, the, you know, getting rid of the whole colonial uh, government and stuff, that, so she was important in that, in that way. Um, however, we knew, uh, I, I knew the minute I was with Omar Sosa and I had given him thousands of, you know, Miriam Akemis recordings and he was like, mm. I don't like it. <laughs> so, which was great because then it was like, okay, I can, I can accept that. I mean, there's some songs of Makeba that I actually like, um, but then that was clarifying, you know, that Omar was not going to work uh, with the sound of Miriam Makeba per se, and or, or create something out of that South African place that it had to come from who he was and who I was, you know. So I feel like that decision from very early on pushed us towards, okay, again, so the sound was built out of the environment, 
You know, you hear plastic, you hear water, you hear stones, you hear breathing, you hear us singing. I mean, you know. Someone talked about the birds, you hear the sounds, the different kind of... Yeah, so, um, you know, Miriam Makepa, you know, if you if you Google her, there's going to be tons of stuff. So, you know, and she was married to, you know, famous man, and, you know, I'm in, you know, Stokely Carmichael, he was a girl, uh, you know, she was brought to the U.S. by Harry Belafonte. So, I mean, she had a, this very storied sort of public life. I, I went to South Africa to kind of, you know, be in Soweto and get a real feeling of what it could be like to come from there. Um, what I discovered was that, you know, people had moved right along, um, <laughs> you know, and I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> Um, what shall I do now? And then I and then I started talking to people who had made work about her. There was one filmmaker who made a film about Miriam Akeba for the BBC, and she had spent a lot of time. You know, if you're a filmmaker, you spend a lot of time with your subject, and discovered uh, you know another side of Makeba. So I have to say, I, I was gathering information that is not necessarily in the books. You know, she's obviously a, a, a hero, an icon. So the books tend to paint her as Mama Africa, you know, this saintly person. But clearly there has to be something else uh, behind that. And that's what I started going for. So I can't really say there's a book that you can read about that. Um, you know, but it, talking to people was my way of getting to another side of Makeba that is not the public side. So then the, the two-ness, the two-ness, you know, that you have a public face and then you have a private face, um, uh, you know, that was helpful for me to understand that even though I feel like Makeba should stay on a pedestal, the reality is, uh, you know, she wasn't always um, two, just like nobody is, right? She's, I thank you for exploring that reality. Thank you. I just have one final question, and that is, what is next? You mentioned a little tidbit about something you're working on, you're on something, so could you want to? Um, I, 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 uh, <laughs> sorry, I have to say I have been suffering through a little bit of a headache, so you have to excuse me. I'm not at my best. Um, but I definitely, uh, I've been working on something called Bronze Gothic, uh, I just premiered it, and uh, two friends are here who saw it in New York. Uh, so I'm working on that, uh, that has some dates uh, in other places, so that's kind of my thing. Miss Nora, since Miriam is done touring, what's next for you, Donna? Well, I'm always, I'm always working. I mean, in fact, you know, I, I, I premiered last year uh, a right riot, uh, my take on uh, Nijinsky and Stravinsky, and I'm currently working on uh, a follow-up, a companion piece to that called Portrait of Myself as My Father exploring masculinity and uh, black men, or African men to be specific. Um, so, you know, I'm also, you know, they're, 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 I have thousands of projects that I, you know, people have to rein me in. You know, I, I teach in Africa, I, you know, I have a legacy project with uh, Leze Archons, you know, the pioneering women of uh, uh, contemporary art in Africa. Yeah, uh, shoot, the, the, the 24 hours is just not enough. Yeah, for me. <laughs> that's right, you know, that's right. Um, this has been fascinating. Thank you very much.